I built a YouTube thumbnail tool in three hours that saves me about $500 a month because who wants to pay for a tool that you could just build yourself? So I says to myself, hey, let me show these guys the framework that I use to build apps that I don't want to pay for. So if you're new here, my name is Sean. Over the last eight or nine years, I've been building startups, building products, and this channel is all about helping non-developers build real businesses using AI and technology without the hype. So today I'm gonna walk you through the exact three-step pro framework that I use to build apps from scratch. So that being said, let's get into it. So one of the things I can't stand today is this chasm that has been created in the world of AI, where on one side we have everyone that thinks if you even claim that AI is awesome, you are a complete noob or a liar. So we have this hater camp. They love to live on the world of a Twitter and X predominantly. But then you think, hey, I kind of get it because on the other side you have this group of people that claim that vibe coding is the easiest thing in the world and hey you can just make instagram but for cats with replit and that is your key to success and millions and millions of dollars but what i'm here to tell you is that we can be this evil knievel looking dude on his cape flying across the chasm that's a pretty good superman right there flying across the chasm and obliterating the instagram for cats camp because the thing that frustrates me about all of this noise is this. Vibe coding does allow people to build incredible things, especially people that did not have that skill before, but you need to do it with a brain. Meaning you need to spend a lot of time planning, refining, and iterating in order to build something that actually works and that is actually what you wanted to build in the first place. So for example, if you're planning to build and monetize an app that allows people to edit images and videos at scale, you probably need to think about how you're going to handle processing all of that traffic at the same exact time without crashing your service. So the way that I approach handling this type of stuff is with a step-by-step -step framework that I call the PRO framework. It stands for plan, refine, and orchestrate. And so if you are new to building businesses or products, you need to spend an uncomfortable amount of time in this planning phase, avoiding the temptation of those seems too good to be true one-shot app builds. Unless, of course, you like plain, vanilla, boring, functional apps that aren't even what you really wanted to build in the first place. Because if that is the case, well, then you can just continue doing that. So the question becomes, well, how do you actually plan properly? Because it's not as simple as saying, hey, Claude, make sure you plan first. And so I like to think about planning in four clear stages. So to be clear, I'm not saying never pay for software ever again. I'm saying that there is a very clear distinction between when it makes sense to just build it yourself and when it makes sense to actually buy it. So it makes sense to pay for something when scale and reliability really matter to you and maybe you're not actually a subject matter expert in that thing but when the workflow is very personal you have an opinionated way to do it best and building it is actually approachable based on your skills why not just build the thing for yourself now that being said let's get in and talk about the planning phase so one of the biggest drivers of quote unquote ai slop code is under specified projects. So if you give a bunch of question mark, unknown, ambiguous junk to an AI model, well, what you're gonna get out the other side is crap. Because if it doesn't know what you actually want in detail, how could it possibly give it to you out the other side? And that is the fundamental flaw with all of the dumb one-shot Instagram, but for cats type of workflows. So what this means, if you didn't tell the AI enough of what to build, it is just going to build its own random shit. And so the way that we can avoid this is by having a really detailed planning process. So here are the four phases that I like to plan out. We have discovery, product definition, product design, and then the product architecture. Now in this first discovery phase, this is really about making sure we understand the problem. We've done user research, and we've generally 
validated that this idea will actually work. And so for this example with the YouTube thumbnail design tool, if this was something I wanted to actually monetize, I would need to make sure that this problem is actually validated. Now for me personally, I deal with this every single week. I know that I have to pay a bunch of money to have thumbnails created, which sucks, and that it's often not done the way that I asked for it to be done, and overall causes a lot of frustration and lost time, so I know people would pay for this, and I know the market size is huge. But still, we want to make sure that the problem is validated, that our solution is validated, that there's an adequate market size for this thing, we want to understand what the competitors are, what their value propositions are. Does the unit economics of how we're going to build this thing and what we can sell it for actually make sense? So again, we're trying to discover all we can about the problem and how our solution to the problem might actually fit into this landscape. Now, by the way, if you want a free course where I actually do all of this stuff for a real project, you can check out the link in the description below where I have an entire framework called Tech Snack Lite, where we go through this pro framework and actually use it to build something real. Now, after we've gone through this discovery phase, we need to actually make sure we've defined the product and what we intend to build properly. So this is where we tend to think of like the PRD phase. What are the requirements for our product? What are the different features that we're intending to build? What are the user stories? And what are the success criteria? Meaning, what do those features need to accomplish such that it would actually solve the user's problems? Now, this is why we start with the discovery phase first, because to answer the question, does it solve the problem, means we need to actually make sure we have defined the problem really well. And so what we get out the other side from this stage is a really tight scoping of exactly what it is that we're intending to build what the success metrics of that thing are going to be, what all of the different major features and epics are that we are going to build, and then what this thing actually practically needs to look like. And so we're going to move through and repeat this process for literally all of the features that we have inside of this MVP or inside of the app that we are building. Now, once we're really clear on the problem, we're really clear on the definition of how we're going to solve that problem, it comes down to actually designing the solution. And so this step is really important because I think a lot of people do go through this type of PRD creation phase if they follow some sort of planning process, but they almost always skip over a detailed design phase. So this is where we're trying to understand the actual structure of the information within our app and how we're going to display that or show that to users. How are we going to design the overall user experience? What are the different journeys? How do they move through the app? What are they interacting with? What happens at different stages of our application? How does that all come together into a cohesive UI design system? And then what are our core data models? What is the structure of our database and the shape of this application really need to look like? And so to go back to that like tongue in cheek example of the Instagram for cats thing, if we're not really spending the time to define what the problem really is and how that manifests in all the different user stories and requirements, then what's going to happen is the language model that we are using is going to just make assumptions about all of this stuff. And then it's going to make really basic assumptions about how the user is going to actually experience this app. It's going to cut corners. It's going to make the most basic version of this thing possibly imaginable. And then you're going to be left with something that, yeah, it technically kind of works and turns on, but it doesn't in any way meet what that thing was that you were really thinking in your head about what this app should be. And so if we were to look at a real project I have where we're inside of this design phase, we're getting very detailed about the actual user journeys and flows through every single component of our application and what needs to happen at each piece. So in this app, as an example, we have this functionality where we can actually use a bounding box editor to make specific adjustments to this image. But that entire workflow of how I moved from selecting it from the gallery all the way through to sending through the request to the back end to make the change, all of that was predefined ahead of time. And every single state that could possibly happen was planned out ahead of time. 
And we are repeating this process for every single user flow, for every single screen that we could actually have inside of this application, for all of the main components. It's all being planned out ahead of time so that when we go to build, it all makes sense. It's all cohesive. And then we can spend time really making sure it's done professionally because we can use all of those language model tokens to really think creatively about how to do this in the best way possible. Now, the last piece of this planning phase is the actual tech architecture where we're thinking about our tech stack and the technical setup, how the different APIs are going to be structured, the security of the application, how we're going to optimize for performance. Again, all of this planned out ahead of time and documented so that when it comes time to go build this thing, it is a very fast, seamless process where all of these core considerations are already outlined. And all of this that we just talked about is done before we actually write any code. But here's the thing. In all of these phases, AI is rarely correct the first time it passes through. Because again, it's making guesses about what you, the user, probably would have wanted based on what you've told it so far. And so that is why our second phase in the pro framework is the refinement phase. And what this means is that for every single phase that we move through, before we go to the next stage, we want to make sure we're having a dialogue with the language model and iterating on the plan it just gave us back. And so we have prompts that we can use for this refinement phase, which we can configure to have it grill us more or less, depending on how important of a project this is and exactly how detailed we want it to be and exhaustive we want it to be in questioning our fundamental assumptions. But it is now going to take our, in this case, initial PRD that we had from this definition phase, and it's going to push back and challenge us and ask questions about the ambiguities that still exist. So for example, in this thing that I was building, one of the big assumptions was that this whole bounding box thing that I just showed you, where we're able to select stuff like this, the assumption that this is actually supported in the Gemini API, which I happen to know that it was, but point being, it is going to move through and find all of the ambiguities that exist in your plan and dial those in again before we start building things out. And so we're sparring back and forth with the AI about each output to make sure that we're actually aligned on what we are planning and why we are building that thing specifically. And so this refinement phase is especially important if you want creative outputs. Language models tend to be aligned. So they're very safe and they're very predictable. So if you want interesting and creative outputs, you need to really go back and forth, push its boundaries and force it to think outside of the box in the context of what you are trying to build. But once your plan is planned and refined, it's not really as simple as just giving some huge, huge, unending document to a language model and saying, hey, now go build this thing. And so we need a system to actually orchestrate the build. And so orchestrating here basically means coordinating with the AI to do the things that we just planned. And this is where a lot of these builds tend to fall apart. So there's a lot of methods and tools that you can use to help orchestrate your build. And I've covered a lot of them on this channel. But one of the ones that I find the most effective, especially for beginners, is a tool like GitHub's Spec Kit or even Amazon's Kiro IDE. Because those tools specialize in taking documentation, like the documentation that we just built, and turning them into concrete development plans that do not drop important details. So we can have it move through, put more bones to our plan, and then have it go task by task, building out everything that we need done. And so I never ask the AI to build the entire thing at once. I treat it like a junior engineer with very contained tasks that are implemented incrementally, step by step. And so for this entire application that we are looking at, that core orchestration phase took about an hour. And so for this app that we've been looking at as an example, it's pretty cool. I can upload images of myself and train a character, and then I can move through to the generation phase. I can type in a natural language prompt like this. I can hit generate, 
And in this case, we get this nice interactive kind of loading process, again, because we planned this thing out in detail and had it really think about the UX and the UI of every single component that we had. And out the other side, we get a really nice thumbnail, which, by the way, has increased my thumbnail performance by about 30%. And it only costs a few dollars per month for me to run. So all in all, pretty awesome process. So if you want to see a video where I actually use GitHub Spec Kit to orchestrate a build, I will link to it right here so you can just click that and see how that orchestration phase really works. But that is it for this video. I will see you in the next one.